thanks to you, Olivia, for inviting me to uh, this spectacular conference. As has been mentioned, Olivia was, uh, she knew me, at, she knew the larval Kerwin, one might say. She was uh, on my dissertation committee and remained a trusted friend and advisor. So when she said, you know, I wonder whether you could come, I interpreted that as, shut up and come. <laughs> and so, <laughs> schedules notwithstanding, here, here I am. Um, uh, I asked Olivia and Nick a couple of weeks ago, uh, what should I talk about? And I hadn't prepared anything. I, and so one idea was to sit through the conference and respond to the papers I saw over the course of a day and a half. That's one idea. I really enjoyed yesterday's discussion and this morning's. And in sleep before I went to bed last night, I thought, you know, I'm going to go slightly different. I will not respond because I thought the discussions were so robust. I will instead focus on four or five papers on which I've worked and the themes that have emerged from them uh, in the hope that they, the results I'll discuss will be useful to policymakers and scholars in the room. Okay? Let me make sure this thing works. So I'm Kerwin. Um, so we know a lot about, about differences in wealth. For one thing, we know the differences are gargantuan. Massive differences. If you didn't know that, you now certainly know it after sat to, sitting through this conference the last day and a half. Yeah? When I first became interested in this topic many, many years ago, one immediate question that came to mind was the fact that wealth is, as everyone knows, a stock variable. Wealth is created out of the streams of stuff that people receive. Yeah? And so when I observe a racial difference, a massive racial difference in wealth, the stock measure. One thing that comes to mind immediately, well, is it something about differences in the flows that people are using to produce wealth? Yeah? Is there something different about the mechanism by which wealth is produced out of different flows? Yeah? I'm not the first person to whom this question occurred. So there's a very well-known paper by Francine Blau and Graham that take on this question. And so they said, it's a QJE paper from about 20 years ago. They said, look, here's, the idea. here's an idea. We can do a kind of blinder Oaxaca decomposition. We can distinguish between the differences by race in the flows I just described. These would be income flows, permanent income, however measured, from a kind of what I'm going to call wealth-generating function. Do you see? A wealth-generating function. And what they did is what you might do. You run a regression of wealth on income, yeah? And you do it separately by race, you get the two coefficients, you switch the beta, and you're gonna disentangle the importance between the betas and the Y bars. How are we doing? Good, we're doing good. What's the difference between the betas and the Y bar? Now, this result is consequential, because if after all it is demonstrated, having done that, that the preeminent driver of the observed wealth gap is the difference in the wealth generating function, something I've just now described, that suggests, rather pessimistically, that shifting the income distribution, which is a thing policymakers can do, taxes, minimum wages, yeah, shifting the income distribution will have at best a modest effect on the observed racial wealth gap if the racial wealth generating functions are different. Yes? And Blau and Graham say, you know what? They're very different. They're very different. And their huge paper says they are so different that indeed, having done that exercise, it appears that income, the policy variable most amenable, or the variable most amenable to policy perturbation and manipulation, yeah, doesn't play that big an effect. It's something fundamentally different about how these two racial groups produce wealth. Good? Francine Blau is a tremendous scholar. And so it was with some nervousness that I sort of gently raised my concern. Here's a concern. Think about what they're doing. You're running a regression of wealth on income. Let's say income is broken into bins, low, medium, and high. Yeah? And you're running that regression differential by race. Yeah? You get the beta, and then you do the Wagwahaka thing I just described. Now, a problem that immediately becomes apparent is this problem. Is a problem that in the far right tail, not even that far right, yeah, in the right tail, 
there's just not a lot of black income. Yeah? It's not that there's none. There's not a lot of black income. And so, in effect, for the white population, you're fitting a line, fitting a line through low, medium, and high income. For blacks, you're fitting a line through low and medium income. Yeah? The dotted line in this figure represents what they did. Do you see? Not the dotted one. I mean, the smooth, you know, the continuous one. Yeah? And so, my friend and colleague John Bound and Bob Barsky and I said, imagine we examine this question and took cognizance of the fact that there is a missing, there's a hole, as it were, in the right tail of the income distribution. Notice that a hole in the right tail of the income distribution is irrelevant if the wealth generating function is linear. Can you see what I mean? If the wealth generating function is actually linear, any two points you remember from third grade gives you the line. Yeah? Yeah? But it turns out that the wealth generating function might not be linear. And so we do a series of exercises a series of exercises. And what we show is that if one fits something nonlinear, a baby nonlinear function, go quadratic, yeah? Lowest smooth relationship, whatever. What one discovers immediately is that the conclusion that income, these flows that I just described, don't matter appreciably for the observation of wealth gap goes away. Because the difference in the wealth generating function that is evident in the continuous straight line is much, much smaller in either of the other two lines on that picture. Yeah? This result was interesting and important to me because it brought to the fore the importance of income. Income. When we're talking about wealth, we always have to have something about income and permanent income in our minds. Yes? As I mentioned, the appeal of income is that it's a policy manipulable variable. And what this result established for me is that differences in income turn out to matter hugely. From where do differences in income come, emerge? Nick has mentioned that much of my work has been about differences by race in income generation and the role that discrimination of various types plays in generating those gaps. Statistical discrimination has been the focus of some work. Prejudice-based discrimination, yet others. Yeah? The point is that there are these fundamental differences that generate these gaps and that we would be wrong, we would have been wrong if we didn't take account of how the shape of the function inaccurately led us to conclude wealth was generated. Yeah? I'll be moving through in the 20 minutes allotted me, 25 or so, papers quickly. And so I love some questions at the end, but this is how I got into this thing. Interested in income differences, interested in income differences insofar as they relate to wealth. Yeah? That's one set of projects for me that has me always thinking about income when I think about wealth. Good. Sorry, how can I go back? Red. Yeah, sorry. Yesterday, uh, in a seminar, in a discussion, uh, my friend Damon Jones and Sandy Black uh, in the discussion comment said, I paraphrase, something like, what's black or who's black? And so I was sitting in the back of the room and I had exactly that question. Um, I was saying to Damon last night, this question about how one conceives of race, how the scholar brings race into her analysis is of fundamental importance. People from sociology are versed with the sociology literature will know there is a raging debate in that important field about whether race is socially constructed. This is a term you may, yourself may have used, yeah? Is race socially constructed? What do people mean by that? People mean things like, when I observe an agent in the world, I see his corporeal self. You see me standing before you, an African descended man, yeah? I have a certain pigmentation, hair texture, kind of like that, yeah? And you attach to that a kind of racial classification. Good. But you also have other things you attach. You attach things about honor and presumed quality. And you see, the great sociologist, the great sociologist, Irvin Goffman, my all-time leading social scientist, favorite social scientist, speaks of the phenomenon of stigma. Yeah? And so maybe 
my corporeal self, is more than hair texture, nose width, kind of like melanin, kind of like that. Yeah? There are things that he calls stigmatized phenomena that attach to my racialized identity. Yeah? It's an important thing. Sandy Darity and others who work on stratification build on and extend this theme. I'm not going to touch on that today. My not touching on this should, it should not indicate it's unimportant. It's hugely important. I would instead focus on a couple of more prosaic matters, things that you might encounter yourself, leaving aside the how is race socially constructed important question. Here go one question. So a black man and a white woman have a child. What is the child? What is the child? What does your child call herself? Is she equally likely to call herself black and white or mixed race? Is she, depending on her parents' income, equally likely to pick one or the other? Mixed race status is an increasingly prevalent feature of the American economy. This is something that in 1860 existed hugely, of course. We know it was one-sided, the product of, of anyway, involuntary conduct. Let's leave that aside. But in the recent decades, we have seen a large increase in mixed race offspring. And in a separate paper, my colleague and friend Jean Gurian and I wonder who, who classifies themselves as mixed race? Yeah. It turns out the census and CPS changed the ability to, yeah, and so we use that switch. And it turns out that it's not random. Not everybody switches evenly, yeah. Particular kinds of people call themselves mixed race, you see? And so there is a practical question for the scholar for the people in this room. Given that people will be differentially likely to self-code one way or the other, the analyses you do that control for race or split people into racial bins, yeah, become imperfect and flawed and controversial in a way that I think the comments here should make clear. Here's a different thing, a different phenomenon. Foreign-born. It has been mentioned that I'm dean of the Yale School of Management. And I, I have the water. Thank you. I met with my, uh, some black Yale undergrads last week. And they're, you know, they're wicked smart and they're brilliant and talky talking to me. Anyway. <laughs> so they're talking to me and so on, and they say, Dean, where do you stand on the ADOS question? ADOS question. How many people in the room know what that means? One person, two people. What, is, what do they mean? Here's what they mean. Thank you so much. African descendants of slaves, yeah? Or American descendants, either way, one or the other. They switch back and forth. This is a big thing among the young whippersnappers. If not among you, it's a big thing among them. Because they say, look, when thinking about policy, when thinking about policy, restorative policy, ameliorative policy, kind of like that, should I regard every African descended person, every black person, if I may use that thing, the same? Yeah? Does the country owe the debt, the same debt, to an eighth generation black person? Yeah? As to a black person who is from Kenya, or whose dad is from Trinidad. You see what I'm saying? And how large a concern or a phenomenon is this? Well, let's look and see. Let's look and see. So this is not from me, this is from Pew. And Pew earlier this year summarized the sheer of African Americans of prime age. I called the guy, he's going back and forth, said, you ask what? Leave that aside, yeah? Roughly, prime age black Americans who are foreign born, yeah? This is going to continue growing every year. Yeah? It'll continue growing hugely. Now, here are some things that are really interesting about that. It turns out that the foreign born population, in the first generation, meaning the people themselves, and even their children, have dramatically different outcomes relative to their African-American counterpart. Very different, yeah? Various questions immediately come to mind. I have mentioned ADOS, yeah? What does that have to do with how I think about restorative policy? University of Pennsylvania, yeah? Wishes to launch some initiative. I don't know Penn's history, but if it's like every other institution in the country, it ain't so great on race. You see what I'm saying, do you? 
I'm guessing, with all due respect. It's not so great. And so they decide to do something, yeah? They decide to do something to bring kids, whatever they do. And the kids they bring in are all the children of Tanzanians or Guyanese. That's an important policy question for us, a moral question, a question of justice and fairness, thus and so. Do you see? Reparations come to mind. I have not heard reparations mentioned at the conference. Maybe it's when I stepped out for a few minutes, but <laughs> I have not heard it mentioned. People talk about reparations a lot, yeah? And when you talk about reparations, they're thinking about reparations to whom for what? <laughs> to whom for what? What is the United States giving reparations to some guy from Senegal for? You see? Kind of like that. ADOS is complicated itself. I said to the students, let me ask you something. They said, I said, let me ask you something. I said, what do you call, is Colin Powell, Eidos? They said, um, you see, Colin Powell is a child of Jamaican immigrants. So I had them a little bit. Then I said, let me ask you this. What about, what about Biggie Smalls? Anybody in the room know who Biggie Smalls is? Yeah, good. One of my all-time favorite rappers. Biggie Smalls is descended from Caribbean immigrants, both sides. And then I said, what about Barack Obama? Barack Obama is not descended on slaves from either side. You see? And so we shouldn't quietly sit back without vigorous engagement with these themes. We should say, when the themes come forward, what do you mean by Eidos? Define it, kind of like that. Yeah? That is something that the people in this room, and include myself in that, will have to grapple with going forward as we think about policy. Good. Right. I'm an economist, as has been mentioned. And we think about wealth generation from our lifetime optimization model, yeah? A guy is optimizing U1, U2, he has a flow of income, Y1, Y2. You see, Y1 might be low, Y2 high, God willing, yeah? He saves, he smooths, we say, yeah? He bases spending on his permanent income, kind of like that. We write it down. In our talking about optimization, wealth, and income, economists in particular, usually adopt an individualistic, homo economicus framing. I'm talking about Fred, you see? Joanne, kind of like that. Humans aren't like that. There's no such thing as Fred. Fred belongs to a group. Fred sees himself as belonging to a group. Fred says, I'm a griffin, he says, yeah? Fred's family is one hugely important subgroup. And this subgroup, matters in an incredibly important way for how wealth is generated from the flows of income I've earlier described or discussed. In a series of papers over many years, when you said a couple of decades, that really threw me, man. <laughs> over a long time. <laughs> Let's just go with that. <laughs> over a long time. I've been very interested in this phenomenon of the transfer from one generation to the next of economic status. Income has been the focus of some of my work. Wealth has been the focus of yet another set. Wealth has some appealing traits. It can be directly transferred. It can be transferred after I'm gone. I can leave it as a bequest. I can do intra vivos things, kind of like that. Yeah? And so I've wondered, look, what empirically is the association between the wealth an individual has as an adult and the wealth received by her child, his child. Yeah. It turns out, as I'll show you in a second, that association is big. Precisely because, precisely because wealth and indivi individuals see themselves as being embedded in families, one thing we might wonder is whether marriage, marriage has the capacity to undo the dynastic consequence of point number one. Are you with me? Point number one is saying, I, Kerwin, have a son. I do have a son. And my son is going to get some disproportionate share of my income and wealth, either directly, emulation, whatever it is, kind of like that. That's not good. That's dynasty, yeah? One thing to undo dynasty is if in the marriage market or the partnership formation market, there's random matching. You see what I'm saying? That would undo a dynasty, yeah? Let's see how that go. Let's see how that go. Let's see how that go. 
So this is a paper from a result from one of those papers. And the paper does something very simple. It just takes the PSID over multiple years, and it just asks, look, let me do various associational measures between the prime age adult's wealth, 45, whatever it is we pick, and the wealth of his child. Yeah? And we split the bins into quintiles. Were it the case that there was no stickiness in wealth transmission, yeah? Every bucket should be 20%, yeah? What you should see immediately, and this has been replicated in various cases. I just saw a paper from, uh, I forget the guy's name. Um, uh, yeah, where he does it with Norwegian data. He's got a billion observations, whatever like that. Same result, yeah? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, you see the stickiness in the tails. This is dynastic concern. But then you say, okay, Kerwin, I get your point about the dynasty. What about, what about when people are out there meeting each other, you know, trying to match up? Maybe my son, I'm not rich, let's say I'm upper middle class. Maybe my son, boy of an upper middle class family, meets somebody of a lower middle class family. Yeah? And that way, the thing kind of shuffles up. Yeah. Maybe the Kennedy kid, to take an extreme example, marries a poor girl in college. No, he doesn't. He does not. Yeah? He does not. That the stickiness that comes from direct transfer is in fact reinforced by the nature of marital sorting. My co-author on this project is my friend Eric Hurst, with whom I've written many, many, many papers. And we are now looking at how this stickiness, what it does specifically to ratio the durable intergenerational transmission for different racial groups. I'll let you know how that paper shapes up. But you see the thing, how sticky it is in the tails, right? There's churning, but the churning's in the middle. Yeah? The churning's in the middle, it's not in the tails. Good, all right. All right, did I skip a slide? All right. Let me speak about family structure. So, I have made reference to the fact that um, family is a hugely important driver in how we think about wealth, how wealth is generated, how it is propagated, how it is preserved, the meaning of dynasty, all of it, family. Here's a the deal. There is an astounding difference, astounding difference in family formation patterns in the United States, household formation, not family, household formation. I can get at this many different ways. Yeah? I have observed over time that talking about household formation is a controversial thing. It makes people queasy and uneasy. That's fine. That's fine. We should steer the thing in the face. This is a difference yeah? that is dramatic. What I do there is we're going to be focusing on women. So we take prime age women. 25, I forget, 25 to 54, it's in the paper. 25 to 54, that's exactly it. 25 to 54, yeah? And we sort these women over years in the census. And we ask, look, how are you? What's the, what's the household arrangement here? Yeah? The census calls people householder. And so we're going to separate householder women of different types. There are three possibilities. One, she's single. Two, two, she lives with a partner. Let's leave aside whether she and the partner are married. Let's leave that aside, yeah? And third, she lives with another adult, not her partner. It could be her sister. It could be her high school friend. It could be, yeah? I'm come, I don't have a good name. For now, I'm, I'm going with roommate, yeah? <laughs> I know it's not good, but I, I, when you have a better one, please do send it to me. Look at the, the gap we're talking about here. I decided I was determining last night, this morning, whether to show the trend in this thing. Because the trend in uh, single status among African American women is rising. The middle column is falling over time. And that roommate column is really surging. How does one think of this roommate thing? I, I don't know. Are people, are, do, do people get the gains from trade that we associate with marriage normally? Yeah? Where I specialize, you do the other thing. D does that happen? Yeah? H how are costs split, et cetera? We don't know any of that. It's a hugely understudied phenomenon 
with, in my view, potentially huge implications for the evolution of wealth and wealth differences. Yeah? There's something else about this figure I want to highlight to you, a theme that I'll mention again before I close, and that is that we, it is our want, it is our style, to emphasize mean differences. You see? Sandy Darity's comments yesterday were very interesting to me because Sandy said, and he is right, sometimes we want to use mean, sometimes we want to use mean. In fact, I'm saying that. Yeah. I'm saying sometimes we want to use, yeah? Means mask a lot of things. So what I did in this figure, this is with uh, my former PhD student who is, uh, uh, her name is Renee Gabriel. She's doing a postdoc at Harvard. So Renee and I in this figure, we say, let's sort women by their per capita household income flow status by percentile. So here's the idea. Take a woman, she's in a household. You see the household of three, we take the three people's income, divide by three. Household of one, you see how it goes. Household of four, kind of like that. And what you see right away is something interesting. You see that at the high end, yeah, the difference in family structure is very small. The mean is shielding, is masking quite a bit. At the high end and at the bottom, this is partnership. When we do marriage, the bottom points come even closer together. Yeah? This theme in much of my recent work, and a theme I'll close with, about there being no mean black experience for any outcome that I've looked at in the last decade, yeah? shows up powerfully here. That the non-partner concern or phenomenon yeah, is not a concern at the top end, yeah, nor is it a concern at the bottom end, interestingly. My co-author and I do something else in this paper. We say, look, there is a lot of talk about the role that family structure per se plays in determining adult outcomes. Very famous, excellent scholars have either said this explicitly or hinted at it. Charles Murray, for example, has over the years made this point, and not just Charles Murray, yeah? People on all sides of the political spectrum, my friend Glenn Lowry makes the point, yeah? It's a point. Implicit in their idea or reasoning or conversation is the notion that if we were to somehow, of course this is not possible to do, but work with me, if we were to somehow rejigger the world so that family structures present among whites exist among blacks, what would happen? You see what I mean? They have a view that there is something about the family structure per se that matter. And so uh, Renee and I do something very straightforward. Very straightforward. We do a simulation. I, I keep moving the thing forward. That's not what I mean to do. We do a simulation in which we take a woman of a given percentile point, a black woman, and we a gift to her, we give to her, the family structure of the white woman at the same point, in the white distribution. Do you see? Now, let's say the woman is partnered. We draw the woman's, the black woman's, we, we attach to the black woman the income or earnings associated with the 30th or x percentile of the white woman's husband. I don't think people got me. Let me say it again. So, I take a, a white woman, I'm comparing people to the 40th percentile. Yeah? I take the black woman, I say, what's up with the 40th percentile wife? Oh, she's married. Great. So I attach marriage to the black woman who might be single. And then I say, but what's the income of that guy? Yeah? The guy is at the 25th percentile of the white distribution. So now I go to the 25th percentile, 25th percentile of the black distribution. Yeah? And I pretend the black woman had that income in computing this overall per capita income measure. What happens? If the claim of many Murray and others, Glenn and others is right, that should have a big effect on the observed gap. Yeah? It turns out that that exercise does virtually nothing to the gap. Virtually nothing. And one of the reasons that's so is that if you think about the black man at the 26th percentile of the earnings distribution among black men, exam question, what is his income? Zero. Thank you. So, reshuffle it. Do, do you see? Do you see? This work is ongoing. It is, it scratches my sociology itch. I like it. 
Um, but, but I want to mention it to you before I move on. Okay? All right. Household structure. This, con this conference has been about retirement. We've appropriately spent a lot of time talking about retirement. But for the given agent, retirement is not all he's thinking about. He's thinking about lots of stuff. Yeah? Here's something you might be thinking about. Yeah, I'm thinking about what my wealth will be when I'm 60. That's one thing he's thinking about. Fine. That's what this conference is about. He's also thinking, I've got to drive to work tomorrow. Yeah? I don't want to deal with the police. I have to try and someone on a date. Yeah? I want to do that. Yeah? I'm going to pay something to satisfy those other ends. I want to be treated with honor and decency and dignity when I interact in the world. I'm going to pay for that. Yeah? And maybe the price he's willing to pay for that comes out of what we might call the things that go into his wealth. Nick Rusinoff next to me is nodding because Nick and I have written a paper about this, about visible consumption and the role that visible expenditure plays in the thinking of African Americans in particular, especially African American men, yeah? not because they're thinking about wealth, but they're thinking about something completely different. And so when you observe some action taken by an agent, which doesn't seem rationally wealth optimizing, you think about all this stuff too. Yeah? Let's push this point forward. There was an excellent paper yesterday. I thought all the papers were great. There was an excellent paper yesterday about differences by race and housing appreciation. What else is this guy thinking about? He's thinking, you know, man, I, I want a place where there's a barber shop, you see, where people can cut my hair, you see? I want to be in a place where when my daughter goes to get cornrows, it's not weird, you see? I want to be in my culture and my community. Everybody's like that. My best friend at Yale lives God knows where. So I said, Eddie, what are you doing? He's an Orthodox Jewish person. He says, I want to live in an Orthodox Jewish community. For him, he's driving an hour and 15 minutes every day. Yeah? Is it so odd? It should not be odd. An African-American person armed with whatever income flows we measure, say it. I don't want to give up X percent of this for that, yeah? Because I want to live around people who know me, like me, understand, and love me. I want to live around my culture, do you see? And so the decision to so do is not irrational at all. Utility functions, as we know, have more than one argument. This is the novel. Good. How am I doing for time, Nick? We're getting close. We're getting close. Okay. I'm going to stop soon. Yeah. A couple minutes. A couple minutes. So let me talk about some policy challenges, okay? Let me talk about some policy challenges, and then I'll shut up. I hope that we get a chance, somebody asks me something about policy and education. I have some thoughts about that, but you can't do everything in 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Here's a challenge we confront. Any observer of the American social science scene someone who's data literate, numerate, someone who's been elbow deep in the data messing around, knows that by virtually every measure, I'm not saying things are perfect, but things are better, yeah? Things are better. The most overt, noxious, racist means of exclusion and discrimination have been rooted out of the economy to a first approximation. If you showed me a neighborhood in America with the housing covenant? Now. I say, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Yeah? Now, here's the point. That has happened. That has happened. And since it's happened, a thing that policymakers have to be mindful of is that the effectiveness of policy implemented, especially if it is race-specific policy, I wish to do this for black people. I wish to do this to benefit, yeah? Runs the risk runs the risk of the raising the ire of the rest of the population. Or at least, if not their ire, then at minimum, their non-vigorous collaboration, do you see? Which may be just as bad. In some ways, in some ways, I like when people don't like me and tell me, you see? I like when 
mistreatment is indecorous, when people are not following rules of decorum, because I don't avoid them, you see? It's the ones who smile at me that make me nervous, you see? And so you might imagine that it's now indecorous to say, I don't agree with this race-specific policy, whatever it is. Let it be race-specific uh, increases in aid and college, yeah? Let it be, I don't care what it is, let it be baby bonds, yeah? Whatever it is. Nobody can say that in polite company. I don't like baby bonds. All right, who says that? But they can feel it. They can feel it. I'm not against baby, I'm just saying. <laughs> and to the extent that they feel it, they can thwart its intended good effects. Nor, I should emphasize, am I talking here only about white people. Increasingly, I think it behooves us to think about race in a broadly inclusive sense. Hispanic Americans now outnumber African Americans as a share of the population. Yeah? Asian Americans have a different set of concerns about the country. There is a case that will be determined, I believe, by June. And this case was brought on behalf of Asian students. Now, their view about whether entry to Harvard and Yale and Princeton, whether their lack of entry comes because people leave that aside, they feel that way. Some people feel that way, yeah? And to the extent that they feel that way, policy will be affected. Let's not pretend about it. Let's be grown up, thoughtful, serious about it. In an era when there is improvement, but life is not perfect, how does one argue for fundamental change? How does one convince people that there is improvement, but the bad things, all of them, has not, have not completely disappeared? There's a fundamental challenge for policymakers, I believe. A second point. If one were to uh, look at African Americans in the South, say, the day after Affirmatics, yeah, and one collected their incomes and their shovel, whatever like that. A striking thing about black people, first of all, they lived in the South. That's right, right away. Yeah? They lived other places, but they were a Southern population. And they were treated in the country roughly the same. In the time since, the second striking thing to me about the African American experience is not only the mean improvement, but the growing heterogeneity. This is discussed too little, way too little. There are black people on this campus and in this room whose experiences relative to 95% of black people, let's say 85% of black people, are completely different. Yeah? So when you talk to me about fixing the black problem, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Heterogeneity imposes upon us the need to be explicit and clear and to recognize that some kinds of problems yeah, address or concern the bottom 15% of the distribution, and another set concern the upper 5%. Yeah? If I'm worried about people not being able to pay their car note or having a broken ankle thrust them into bankruptcy, I'm not worried about me. Don't pretend you're worried about me. I'm worried about the brothers and sisters who are living, not even paycheck to paycheck, whatever the thing is less than that. Yeah? On the other hand, does Penn have a black president yet? Yeah? They will at some point, yeah? It's a different problem, you see? And so we must speak in this nuanced way because the African-American experience itself is increasingly heterogeneous and nuanced. I want to close with this. Systemic racism or discrimination in equality, a term we've heard, a term you yourself may have used. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? I know someone said it, but what do you mean by that? It turns out that in the old days, it was straightforward to understand what was meant if one was a fair-minded, open, reasonable person. I'm going to show you something before I sit down. This is a literacy test from Louisiana in 1960. This test was given to everybody in Louisiana, not everybody. The local village guy there would come and say, there's a test, yeah? And he would give it to black people in particular, yeah? And he'd say, well, everybody's a test. What are you talking about? Race is a test for everybody, yeah? Look at that test. Oh, sorry. All right. So 
I don't even need to read it. It's so ridiculous. It's so like, you know, in the first circle below, right, the first letter of the word beginning with L. What? <laughs> yeah? Um, you know, you see, I saw one from another state. How many people died on the Titanic? Name them. <laughs> you understand me? You understand me? What am I saying? You see? So that is kind of obviously evil systemic racism. A challenge for all of us in the room especially those of us who use the term, is to think hard about what we mean when we say it. Yeah? There are open questions. Yeah? Tests like this don't persist anymore, but there's other stuff. The scholars in this room should find that other stuff. And we have an obligation, it seems to me, if we believe it exists and operates and delimits life capacity, to explain how. What's the mechanism? What's the V? Yeah? so that policymakers can address it. And we must, while so doing, be able to reconcile its continued influence with some of the good news that I began this talk with. There's lots of other stuff I want to talk about, but I want to stop and take some questions. Thank you very much.